Okay, welcome back. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to go through the how many assignment, get some practice with unit conversions. Let's see if your answers agree with mine. So complete the following unit conversion using the metric prefixes. So 184.4 grams to kilograms. So we're gonna be using the relationship between kilo and its base, which is here. So, <clears throat> there go. so start with the value that was measured that we know, which is 184.4 grams. We'll set up our conversion factor. We want <clears throat> grams to cancel. So we'll put it in the denominator, kilograms to remain. So our units cancel. And then our relationship here is that there is a thousand of the base, thousand grams in one kilogram, thousand grams in one kilogram, grams cancel with grams. And since the number's on the denominator, we divide and we get 0 0.1844 kilograms. Okay, B. Um, 5.09 times 10 to the fourth milliliters in liters. So we're going to be using the milla relationship and that there is 10 to the negative three of the base in one millimeter, or there's a thousand milla in one base units. So start with what was measured, what we know, 5.09 times 10 to the fourth. 50,000 milliliters, L, set up our conversion factor. We want milliliters to cancel. We want liters to come out. In the relationship between milla and liters, there's a thousand milliliters in one liter. Milla will cancel with milla. Liters will come out. And so 5.09 times 10 to the fourth divided by a thousand and we get 50.9 liters. So try another one, 0 0.809 kilograms to milligrams. So here we're going to be looking from kilo to, well, the base unit, which would be grams, and then from grams to milla. So there is a thousand base unit in one kilogram. So there's a thousand grams in one kilogram. And there's a thousand milla in one base unit. There's a thousand milligrams in one gram. So <clears throat> let's start with what we know, what was measured, which is 0. 801 kilograms. Our first conversion factor, we want kilograms to cancel. So it's on the denominator and in the numerator, we'll put the base unit grams. Return to our base unit. <clears throat> and then from there, we can go from grams to milligrams, which is what our goal is. And again, there is a thousand base units, thousand grams in one kilogram. And there's a thousand milligrams in one base unit in one gram. So kilogram cancels with kilogram, gram cancels with gram and milligrams remains. And so 0 0.801 times a thousand and then times a thousand again, and we get eight point. 0, 0.01 times 10 to the fifth milligrams. 8.01 times 10 to the fifth milligrams. All right, here's one that can be common when we're talking about um, the uh, wavelength of light. 566.5 nanometers to meters. So we're gonna be using this relationship in that there is a thousand nano in one base unit or one nanometer is one one billionth 
of a base unit. So either one of those relationships is true, but let's start with what we know, what was measured, which is 566.5 nanometers. And we want nanometers to cancel. We want meters to come out. And there is a billion 10 to the ninth nanometers in one meter. It's very, very small. And so this wavelength of light is 5.665 times 10 to the negative seven meters. Nanometers cancels with nanometers, meters remains. All right, one more of these quick conversions. 4.11 times 10 to the 6, 4,111,000 um, micrograms to kilograms. So let's, we're going to be using micro. There is 1 million micros in one base unit, or there's a million micrometers in a meter. One micrometer is one millionth. 10 to the negative sixth of a meter. So that's micro. And then kilo, there is 1,000 base in a kilo. So those two conversion factors start with what we know, 4.11 times 10 to the six micrograms. We want microgram to go away. And we want gram, our base unit, to come out. And then we want to go from our base unit grams and have kilograms come out. And so there are a million or 10 to the 6 micrograms in one gram. And there is a 1,000 grams in one kilogram. That's a mu. <clears throat> so microgram cancels with microgram, gram cancels with gram, and we get 4.11 times 10 to the negative 3 kilograms. All right, let's go to the somewhat more challenging problems. An Olympic swimming pool has a volume of 2,500,000 liters. If somebody attempted to empty an Olympic size swimming pool with a five gallon Home Depot bucket, like this ubiquitous bucket we see everywhere, how many bucket fills would we be required to empty the pool? Uh, and we can note that there are 3.785 liters in a gallon. So let's start with what we know, which would be the volume of the pool we're looking to empty, which is 2.5 times 10 to the sixth liters without a decimal point. Those two digits are the only ones we can be sure about their significance. Uh, and so uh, let's convert our Olympic pool's volume from liters to gallons so that it's consistent with our unit of five gallon bucket. And so there is 3.785 liters in one gallon. <clears throat> and then of course there are five gallons in one bucket full or in one scoop of a bucket. It's ultimately, I guess, what we're looking for. How many bucket fulls, how many scoops? So liters will cancel with liters and gallons will cancel with gallons. How many scoops or bucket fulls will remain? And so we'll take 2,500,000 and divide by 3.785 and then divide that number by five again and we get 1.3 times 10 to the fifth scoops, or it's gonna take you uh, 
130,000 about scoops. So a long time uh, if you're working by yourself to empty an Olympic pool with one of those buckets. Probably need a pump. Okay, here's a fun one. A water molecule has a length of 0 0.27 nanometers. This is why chemists use angstroms because of this kind of awkward size. Uh, one cubic centimeter, uh, one milliliter of water contains 3.34277 times 10 to the 22nd molecules. Thanks, Avogadro. If those molecules were lined up end to end, how many times could the line of water molecules stretch to the sun and back? Wow. The sun is 151 million kilometers from the earth. Okay. Well, what do we know? Uh, we know how many water molecules we have. I'm sure somebody measured a gram of water or a milliliter of water. Uh, and did some factors uh, converting with um, Avogadro's number. So let's start with the number of molecules. And from there, we can find a length of molecules using how long each molecule is. And that would be in nanometers. And from there, we can go to meters, Kilometers, those are pretty easy conversion factors, just using prefixes. And from there, we know how many kilometers it is to the sun, so we can go trip to the sun. What would that be called? Earth to sun. And since we want to be specific, the question asks, how many times can this do a round trip sun and back? We're going to have to take that number and divide by two because it's a round trip, divide by two, and that would equal round trips. All right, let's begin. We've got a plan, so start with what we know. 3.34277. Times 10 to the 22nd water molecules. One molecule is 0 0.27 nanometers. So we have a length. There is, according to our prefix rules, 10 to the 9th nanometers in one meter prefix definition, and there's a thousand base units or a thousand meters in one kilometer. So now we know how long in kilometers these water molecules would line up. And since we're talking about trips uh, to the sun, there is 151,88,433 kilometers. I do this for a living. Kilometers. A lot, let's just say. Uh, to the sun. So let's figure out how many that is. A number that's probably easier for me to pronounce. 59.7. Uh, three, six, four trips to the sun. We're going to go to the sun and then return back to the earth. And so we're going to divide by two. And that gets us 29.86. Uh, eight, two trips. Round trips, excuse me to the sun, but of course, that's not a full round trip. If somebody takes me 0.86 of the way there, if a flight takes me 0.86 the way home, I'm not actually home. So I can actually only get 29 round trips. A round trip would be a whole counted thing. Uh, so a few more water molecules and I'm almost to 30 round trips. 
Okay, a cyclist in an 80 kilometer race averages a speed of 21 miles per hour. Pretty decent with a cadence, a pedaling rate of 80 rotations per minute. How many times did the cyclist pedal in the race? There are 1.609 kilometers in a race. All right, so <clears throat> start with what we know. What was measured? The length of the race. We have a speed and rotations per minute, a cadence. But let's start with the trip, the race, which is 80.0 kilometers. Our bicyclist is going 21 miles per hour. So let's find out what our race is in miles and get rid of kilometers and go to miles. Once we know the race in miles, we can find out how long it took the cyclist to run that race in hours. And if we know how long the race was in hours, because there's 60 minutes in every hour, we know how long it took the cyclist at 21 miles an hour to run a 80 kilometer race in minutes. And since we know that that cyclist at the rate of 20 miles an hour, 21 miles an hour, excuse me, we know how many rotations in the cadence per every minute. And so we can find out how many rotations the cyclist uh, performed. So kilometers cancel with kilometers. Miles would cancel with miles. Hours will cancel with hours. Minutes will cancel with minutes. So let's put in the values here. There is 1.609 kilometers in a mile. The cyclist was going 21 miles every hour. There are 60 minutes in one hour. And the cadence was 80 rotations a minute. So we know the units cancel. Let's look at the arithmetic. It's going to be 80.0 divided by 1.609 and then divided by 21. So a couple hours maybe to run this race, two to three, then 60 minutes in an hour. So times 60 and then times 80 rotations per minute. So I get 1.14 times 10 to the fourth rotations. Or at that cadence, at that speed, and that distance of a race, the cyclist about 11,400 times is going to rotate uh, the pedals. So some of us might have been around for the 2018 campfire in Northern California, which burned a uh, a total of a hundred and sorry, uh, I'm sorry, 621 kilometers squared area when it finally finished its destruction. To put this in perspective, or maybe the Allen Hancock campus is 105 acres of surface area. How many times could the Allen Hancock campus fit in the burn area of the campfire? Just to kind of put into perspective the devastating sized fire this was. One acre is 4.04 uh, six times 10 to the third uh, meter squared, 4,000 square meters. And so let's start with what we know, which is the surface area of the fire, which was 600 and 21 square kilometers. We can go from kilometers squared to meters squared, a base unit easily using our prefix system and our little bit knowledge about what to do when we have exponents in our units. So more than that in a second. And then from meters squared, we can use the definition of an acre. 
And once we know the uh, area of devastation in acres, we know how many acres is one campus of Allen Hancock. So we can go from there to Allen Hancock campuses. So <clears throat> we wanna get rid of kilometers and we want meters to remain. There are a thousand meters in one kilometer. That's based on the definition and the prefixes. And then to square everything, we just square everything and the factor. So the units square, one squared is one and a thousand squared is a million. So make sure that you're doing those correct squaring of everything. Once we have that, we are told that there is 4.04686 times 10 to the third meters squared in one acre. So 4,000 square meters, meter sticks squared makes up one acre. And <clears throat> one Allen Hancock College campus, according to Wikipedia, is 105 acres. So kilometers squared will cancel with kilometers squared. Meters squared will cancel with meters squared. Acres will cancel with acres. So how many times could the Allen Hancock campus fit? Uh, let's see, I get 1.46 times 10 to the third, 1,000, 1,460 times campuses. So a thousand, about 1500 times greater than the footprint of our campus. So pretty devastating fire in Northern California. The average human at rest breathes 15 times per minute and exhales around half of a liter of air per breath. The SpongeBob SquarePants balloon in the Macy's Thanksgiving Parade holds 16,200 cubic feet of air. How long would it take the average person breathing regularly to fill the balloon? There are 3.281 feet in a meter. All right, so kind of an interesting idea. Uh, how long? Uh, I'm assuming because this balloon is so big, uh, that it's probably going to take us days just breathing regularly. So I'm going to ask days. If it's a lot of days, uh, we could go to months or years. Uh, if it's a really small amount of days, then maybe we'll convert back to hours. But I'm going to just make a hypothesis and say, let's go with days. Uh, and so to do that, we're going to want to convert the volume of air that we start with start with how big the balloon is, 16,200 feet cubed. There's only three of these digits without a decimal point. We can be sure our significance. So we'll say three significant figures. We can go from feet cubed to meters cubed using the definition that's provided. And there's a handy conversion factor that one meter cubed equals a thousand liters. That is useful to know um, for the tests on your conversion uh, factor sheet that's provided um, with the boot camp or with your class, hopefully. <clears throat> and then from liters, we can. Um, figure out how many breaths that is because there's half of a liter uh, produced on average per breath. And then if we know how many breaths would take to fill the balloon, then we can go from breaths to minutes because the average person breathing regularly breathes 15 times per minute. And then from minutes, uh, if the goal is days, we can go to hours using our definitions and uh, days from there. 
All right, so let's see it in action. Got a lot to do here. So feet we want to cancel, meters we want to come out, and there is 3.281 feet in every one meter. We want to cube everything, so cube, cubed, one cubed, cubed, and cubed this value. <clears throat> and then from there, as I mentioned, there in one meter cubed, we want to go to liters. There's a thousand liters in one meter cubed. We're talking about the human breath. The human breath on average is 0 0.5 liters. <clears throat> And Google tells us that a person breathes 15 breaths every one minute. There are 60 minutes in one hour. And there are 24 hours in one day. So feet cubed cancels with feet cubed. Meters cubed cancel with meters cubed. Liters cancel with liters. Breaths cancel with breaths. Minutes cancel with minutes. Hours cancel with hours. And days remain. So we're going to take 16,200 and divide it by 3.281 cubed so make sure that you cube that number and then times a thousand divided by 0.5 then divided by 15 then divided by 60 then divided by 24 and with three significant figures i get 42.5 days so maybe we could go to weeks if we want to. Um, I think days was a pretty good guess. 42.5 days breathing regularly to fill SpongeBob. So if you're going to try to fill by yourself with that balloon, I guess with air, which wouldn't, wouldn't float, uh, for Thanksgiving, you're going to need to start preparing in October. All right, number seven. A college chemistry professor is six foot and zero inches tall and weighs 170 pounds. Convert his height and weight to meters and kilograms. Okay, that's the first step. So uh, six feet. Uh, let's see, you can go from feet to inches because we have how many inches or how many centimeters, 2.4554, that should say 2.54 centimeters. Uh, 2.54 centimeters are in an inch. And then we can use our definition of prefixes to go from centimeters to meters. <clears throat> there are 12 inches in one foot. There is 2.54 centimeters in one inch. And there is 100 centimeters in one meter. And so I get 1.83 meters tall. The six foot professor is. And 170.0 kilograms. Or I'm sorry, not kilograms, pounds. Oof. <clears throat> and then there is 2.205 pounds in every one kilogram. And so I get 77.10 kilograms.
And so I want to know how much the paper would weigh that stacks 1.83 meters tall. So start with what we know, 1.83 meters, which is the same as six feet. Well, we have the thickness of paper, Hammerbell Copy Paper Plus weighs 20 pounds per ream of 500 sheets. And each sheet is 0 0.097 millimeters thick. So how tall is the professor in millimeters? So for every meter, there's a thousand millimeters. So this is how tall the professor is in millimeters. And if we do that, we can say that every one piece of paper is 0 0.097 millimeters thick. And that hammer mill copy paper is 20 pounds for every 500 pieces of paper. And so meters cancel with meters. We get the professor in millimeters. Millimeters cancel with millimeters. How many pieces of paper? 500 pieces of paper cancel and every 500 is 20 pounds. So we take 1.83 times 1,000 divided by 0 0.097 times 20, and then divided by 500, and with three significant figures, I get 755 pounds. So the stack of paper, six feet tall or 1.83 meters tall would be 755 pounds. And if we want in kilograms, Again, there is 2.205 pounds in every one kilogram. Pounds cancel with pounds, and we get 342 kilograms. So the stack of paper would weigh more, about four to five times more than the professor uh, themselves. So it's believed to take 10,000 hours of practice to master a subject. If you are in chemistry class for five hours a week and study two hours outside of class for every hour in class, which is suggested, how many chemistry classes, considering in and out of class practice with 16 week terms, will it take to master chemistry? Well, so five hours a week, five hours per week. Plus we're studying two hours outside of class per every hour in class. So that's 10 hours a week. This is in class, this is at home. So considering in and out of class, we have 15 hours per week studying chemistry or practicing. So we wanna know how many classes it's gonna to take to do 10,000 hours of practice. So start with what we know, which is 10,000 hours. At our current rate, we are looking at 15 hours of practice every one week. And if we're looking at chemistry classes, there are 16 weeks in every one class, every one semester. And so it will take 41.6 classes, but of course to pass the class, you gotta go all the way through the class. Uh, if you quit at 0.6 class, uh, then you'll fail the class. And I don't know, I guess there's different ways to think about how to accomplish this, but I would say let's finish the class. So 42 terms, 42 classes at the rate of 10 hours outside study and only five hours a term in class, 42 terms. So it's going to take a while uh, to become a 
chemistry master, if it's still um, a struggle, then that's okay. That's what we're here for. So I hope this helps and best of luck studying.